getting this thing started. How would you describe what exactly it is that you do? Right. I help people raise their consciousness levels so they can find heart or love and beingness as themselves. Mm. I don't do much else. That's about it. <laughs> what else is there to do? <laughs> well, That's I used wonderful. to be a naturopath and I used to be a psychotherapist and that was very, that was different type of work. It was still work in service. And I still use uh, the, the psychotherapy skills to help people remove whatever obstacles they find in the way of their heart and in the way of uh, higher consciousness. So what are some obstacles? Is there a commonality that you find between um, your students or disciples or people that come to you in general that um, we all share? Things that are holding us yeah, back. It's, it, it's all the belief systems that you hold. Mm -hmm. uh, any belief system that you have is a kind of a prison. Um, because when it gets challenged, uh, people go into contraction. They go into resistance, uh, which is lower consciousness. And so it's very difficult to maintain higher consciousness if you're constantly contracting and resisting life because your belief system's expectations aren't getting met. Mm -hmm. And so when we were born, uh, we didn't have any belief systems. We were actually free. And then we got given a whole pile of belief systems from mum, dad, our schooling, our government, our religion, our peers. And a lot of these belief systems are simple prisons. They keep us trapped in the mind, away from going beyond the mind. And so a lot of the work in raising consciousness levels is actually undoing everything, not about learning more things, but about undoing the things that we've already learned. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it's like a path of negation. <laughs> it's a path of destruction. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, so that's saying, which is what I hold, is a destructive process. You're undoing things. You're not it's not personal growth. It's not becoming bigger, better, and more powerful. If anything, it's about becoming less than so you can fly. Hmm. Most people are too heavy to fly. Ooh. And so as you undo all these belief systems, you become lighter and lighter and freer and freer. Hmm. Yeah. Too heavy to fly. Wow. Well, so people have glimpses. They get to the top of the mountain for a short period of time and they love it because they can see for hundreds of miles and then they want to get back to the top of the mountain. But what stops them from staying at the top of the mountain is all these heavy belief systems that uh, cause contraction when the expectations on them aren't met. Mm -hmm. mm. Yeah. So that may seem to someone that has no clue the layman one could say that may seem daunting right destructive yeah. a negative path yep. they may say why why would i even want to go down that path what would you say is i, I the can incentive? answer that question <laughs> high consciousness rocks lower consciousness sucks it's simple <laughs> <laughs> yeah plainly put that's a good way to put it <laughs> so what <laughs> what rocks about it you know what is the uh you know what's the so in co higher consciousness now i got into higher consciousness first um because I, I went into business and higher consciousness dictates that you can see through your mind and you see the consequences of everything you say everything you do and you see the consequences of everything everyone else is saying and doing. In other words, you see the big picture. You're not caught in small dramas. You're a bit like the general sitting above the battle, watching all the skirmishes. You're not caught in the front line. Lower consciousness is all front line stuff, small story, dream, whereas higher consciousness is way above that. Higher consciousness allows you to succeed in every adventure in life. Lower consciousness quite often keeps you in failure. Mm. 
And so that's not just business, but it's also uh, spirituality in going for uh, heart, finding love, going for enlightenment. You can't go straight from lower consciousness to enlightenment. You actually have to remove the obstacles that are in the way. Most people don't experience a great deal of love because they're too closed and too defended. They experience primal bonding, which they think is love. But true love is the most magnificent thing a human being can experience. It's so beautiful. But because we went to school and learned to defend ourselves against everything that was there, most people are quite closed. And that closure creates a problem for them because they can't be open enough to perceive love. Mm. It's actually sad when you put it that way. That's sad. So love consciousness sucks. It sucks, man. Yeah, seriously. Oh, wow. Yeah, it's, we're, we're born in love and conditioned out of it. It's unfortunate. Hmm. Yeah, that's true. Now, would you say, even though we all seem to be um, caught in samsara, as they say, that there is hope for all of us, though, to be able to see that unconditional love? I don't know. You see, I, I was one of these people who had a lot of intervention uh, starting when I was about 19 years of age and then continuing. Uh, I think that most people stay the same from about 19 until they die. There's not much about them that changes because mm. they've got all their default patterns in place. Um, the people who change are people who have intervention of some kind whether it's personal growth or some kind of spiritual growth group or some some teacher, they have intervention somewhere along the line. Mm. And without intervention, people don't tend to change a great deal, Mm -hmm. if anything. So what would you say are the strongest interventions overall for us? (laughs) <laughs> how about the truth? <laughs> <laughs> well, how about this? What's the strongest way that the truth could work its way into our life to be a parent? Well, for me, it was coming in contact with awake spiritual people. Um, I was into personal growth from the age of 19 to about 29, 28, and I was removing limiting belief systems in that in that particular variety of personal growth, which allowed me to be quite successful in business. As a matter of fact, I retired by the time I was 28 because I was successful in business. Uh, It keeps going and going and going, though. You, You get into, you start with removing limiting belief systems, then you start to see that uh, there's a lot of things in our lives that cause suffering for us because we go into resistance when uh, something happens. Now, if we're going into resistance when something happens, we're creating suffering for ourselves and people do it because we're very victim orientated as a society. One of the first things that I learned in personal growth was don't ever be a victim of anything. You have to actually volunteer to be a victim. Hmm. Bad stuff can happen, but there's a choice. You do not have to be a victim of it. Now, the moment we turn ourselves into a victim of it and go into blame, uh, we're going into resistance. We're hurting ourselves. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And I stopped doing that when I was 19. That was massive. That was brilliant. Mm. So essentially it would be to associate oneself with others that are of the victimless mentality as well that's a strong intervention no that's a personal thing because we live in a world that is very victim orientated all the television programs the movies the newspapers the magazines it's all victim orientated and so um it's it's very difficult to associate with people who aren't victim orientated it's something you have to do inside yourself you have to Mm -hmm. see the point Mm -hmm. that Um, someone does something and I get hurt, well, I'm making myself feel. They're not hurting me. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm making myself feel. And when we start taking that level of responsibility for it, we stop being a victim because Mm -hmm. we're not into hurting ourselves. As long as we're blaming someone else for it, we are hurting ourselves. Yeah. 
And so since 19, I haven't been a victim of anything. And I'm quite old now. That amount, that amount of suffering that I haven't had in my life is brilliant. Sounds beautiful. It is actually beautiful. Mm. The other thing that I moved when I was 19 was worry because I came from a family where there was a lot of worry, my mum in particular. And I just saw, what's the point in worrying? How do, what do you get from worrying except suffering? It doesn't change anything. Mm -hmm. And along with worry, procrastination, these two things take people into a miserable state. And so anytime worry or procrastination would start up in my mind, I would just stop it. I just would not entertain it. I just refused categorically because I wasn't into creating suffering for me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And when you look at it from that perspective, we are in a world where a lot of people create suffering for themselves, quite often not realizing that that's exactly what they're doing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. When you put it that way, like we give permission to feel the suffering. It comes from well, us. We, 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 co we copy our parents. We copy other people. You know, we're programmed to, we're programmed to worry. We're programmed to procrastinate by our upbringing. Mm. Everyone's running true to whatever programming they got when they were children. Yeah. Yeah. So essentially this whole path is a giant deprogramming process. Yes, yes, it is. Yeah. And uh, basically I work as a deprogrammer, <laughs> not a reprogrammer, a deprogrammer, mm -hmm. because we've all been, we haven't been programmed to be happy. We haven't been programmed to find love. We've been programmed to be efficient little machines that get the job done. That's what we were programmed for at school. The two things that we really want, happiness and love, we're not taught. We're not taught at school. Yeah. <laughs> Would you say that's something that isn't even necessarily taught? It's more so just natural? Because what I'm saying is that it's not like logical, like logical programming in a computer, like love or happiness is more just innate. Does that make sense? It does make sense, but it's not true because we're not programmed to find happiness. We're not programmed to find love. We're actually programmed differently than that. And even though happiness and love are innate, it's just that we're not programmed. We're actually programmed to be problem solvers, if anything. Now, problem solving doesn't really bring you happiness and it definitely doesn't find you love because it's trapping you inside a, a dream world of, the, uh, of your own mind. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I meant as a child, yeah. like a, the pureness of a child or a baby. They're almost yes. touching upon that innate nature. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Up until about two or three years old, we can be happy and we can experience a great deal of love. Mm -hmm. And then we close up enough not to be able to. Mm -hmm. wow. So openness counts for everything. So the next question would be, <laughs> where, does, where does one start to um unveil that love that is uh seems to be so hidden within us where do we start i guess what is what are some what are some would you recommend meditation just a basic meditation practice in one's life before you are asking about who do you hang out with well when i when i left school when i was 19 because i was already out of school i decided to find people who are further ahead than me and learn off them. I decided to, to, mm. to find mentors and I did. And I learned from these mentors and when I would learned enough from them and they couldn't teach me anymore, I went on to other mentors because I had a clean, clear understanding that the people you hang out with affect you a great deal. Mm. And if you're hanging out with people who are successful in life, uh, that rubs off to a large degree. If you're hanging out with people who are failing in life, that also rubs off to a large degree. Mm -hmm. It's just how it is. It's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's not a very nice truth, but it is the truth. Yeah. So find the right The people right you hang out with affect you. Yeah. Mm hmm Yeah. It becomes quite apparent to feel that with enough awareness. When you hang out with just in a 
bad situation with bad people and then you hang out in a good situation with good people, there's a clear difference in the internal the internal. I don't feelings. think there's bad people or good people. I think there's ignorant people mm. and people who know. Okay. And there's a difference. Because I don't think people are really bad. I think they're ignorant because if they weren't programmed the way they are, we wouldn't consider them bad. Yeah. You know, I look at people, I look at people who are real failures in life and I, I go there, but for the grace of God goes I. That could be me if I was programmed the same way as that person. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's a good way to look at it. I've heard you say that um, awakening or enlightenment is a sort of act of grace, right? It's not really up to us, right? It's just something that seems to happen spontaneously if one allows it to happen. Um, so with that, it's almost like, it's almost like, yeah, we're lucky to be able to even have that um, awareness of what we're talking about right now. So why, why put people on this? Um, how do I put this? You know, make them, yeah, make them bad people in your head. It doesn't like that's just that's just arrogant, <laughs> you know. So. It wasn't up to us, right? I guess you could say the, the, the sense of the light coming in, it wasn't necessarily up to us. So how could one with enough awareness look down upon another, you know? It's almost wrong to do that, to say there's bad people. Yeah, like you said, that could have been me. <laughs> That's right. So I, I, I love everybody that I meet, but I don't like everybody that I meet because I don't like <laughs> some of their behaviors, mm -hmm. but I love them because I know that their behaviors can't be helped in a lot of ways because that's how they've been programmed. And they didn't program themselves. Their yeah. genetics, their parents, their society, their religion, the people they hang out with, the peers, that's who programmed them. Mm. We, we run true to our programming no matter what. Yep. And um, intervention is about getting programmed differently. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so I, I recognized when I was 19 that a lot of my programming was, you know, horrific because I hadn't been programmed to be successful or happy, really. I'd been pr programmed to actually be a failure in life. And I didn't like the idea. So I got involved with people who were further ahead, mentors, who showed me a different way to be. And I, I did what they told me to do. And I continued to do what they told me to do until those very things became my default patterns. Mm. Mm -hmm. In a lot of ways, that's how I learned how to become a man from a teenager because I grew up in a family where there wasn't that much maturity. Uh, you know, and so I joined an organization called Apex, which takes uh, it's a, a club for under 40 men who go out and do service in the community. And I got to watch these men who were actually men who had manly qualities. And I started to copy them because it wasn't in my family, but these men had it. So I started to copy them. And I took them as my role models and became a man and had manly qualities as a result of copying men. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They were my mentors. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Always the student? Always a student. Always. Still. Mm -hmm. so, still a student. Always a beginner. The moment mm -hmm. we think we know anything, we're closed. Yeah. And closure doesn't work. Closure mm -hmm. cuts us off from existence. Closure cuts us off from our own hearts. <sighs> This is good. But because we're in a teaching situation where we had to know, because if we knew we could repeat the answers and get a mark and get a reward for getting that mark, yeah. there's an awful lot of arrogance that occurs in our society where people think they have to know. And so they think they do know because that's how we were brought up in school. We had to know. That stops us from learning. The moment we think we know, we're closed. Mm -hmm. Wow. This is good. We're only 15 minutes in. I feel like we've covered a lot. This is really good. <laughs> um, wow. So I'm always interested in what 
what are people's interventions like what is that spark for somebody in a lot of lineages a lot of teachings would say essentially in one way or the other it comes down to suffering and a point where we say there's got to be another way there's got to be another way to live outside of this so-called suffering would you say that aligns with a, a sense of truth in your intervention or intervention in general in intervention in general, yes, not in my intervention. Uh, in my intervention at the age of 19, I was running a, a biker gang in, in uh, Manning um, in Perth. Mm -hmm. I was head of the gang. I was a thug. I was a, a very violent, very angry young man uh -huh. who rode motorcycles with, with a club. And my girlfriend went and got herself, bought herself a course, an encounter group course for four days called The Greatness in You Seminar. And she paid $400 for it. This is back in the early 70s. And it was like five weeks wages or something. Mm -hmm. And I thought, you have been ripped off, my darling. Let me go and get your money back. So I went in to see these guys who had sold her the course and they are all in three-piece suits and looked very suave. And I was there in my leather jacket with my black, clothes on looking very rough and i said to him look i just i want the money back I, she doesn't want to do it anymore because she didn't she got talked into it and they said why don't you do the course and i said i don't want to do the course give me the money back and i had a full intention of thumping the money out of them <laughs> mm -hmm. so because that's the sort of character i was back then and and basically they said to me look if you do the course, you can do it for free. And if you feel like paying us afterwards, well, you, well, you can do that. And I said, I don't want to do your course. And they said, and then they said this one thing which got me because I was my own hero when I was 19. They said, what are you afraid of, mate? And that got me. I'm afraid of nothing, you know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so they did this. I, I, I got to do this encounter course. It was four days of full-on encounter. And you fill in a psych form on the first day and then everyone's sitting around in a horseshoe and everyone's friendly and then all of a sudden the lights go out, a spotlight comes on and it comes on me. Mm -hmm. And the, you, and I won't use the words they used because they were so crude, get out here. And I got out there and they worked on me with my psych profile for 12 hours straight. And what I got to see was that I had actually cut myself off from co completely from humanity inside myself, from my own heart, because I'd had such a rough upbringing, I defended myself so strongly that I was cut off from my own heart. And at the 12th hour, this little tiny little woman stood next to me and she looked at me and she said, you know, when I tune into you, all I can feel is a rock a stone, there's nothing there. And it broke, at that point, after being worked on for 12 hours, it broke my heart open. Wow. And all of a sudden, a new life began. I left the gang immediately, swapped my leather jacket and my studded belt for a three-piece suit and started working for them, selling their courses because I believed in what they were doing. Wow. A whole shift in life. Because up until that point, I didn't think I'd be uh, alive in the next year or I might be in prison. Mm. What a shift. Yeah. What an amazing, dramatic shift. But it didn't come from me being in suffering because I didn't consider myself suffering. It just came from this, these mentors opening me up and showing me something about myself that wasn't good. Mm. Yeah. Wow. So what I'm getting from this conversation is seriously surround yourself with the right people. <laughs> it seems to be so important. Wow. It is important. You know, you don't want to be in a boat, uh, rowing a boat with people rowing in the opposite direction. <laughs> yeah, that's a good way to put it. Yeah. Oh, wow. That's good. So I've heard people describe their guru or their master as when they met them or just in teacher in general, it was like meeting themselves. 
would you describe a good teacher like that? Like when you touch base with them, you're almost touching base with yourself? Well, you have to have a definition of what yourself is. Hmm. You see, most people think that the self is the personality, the body, what they think. But when a guru talks about that, when you're meeting yourself, you're not meeting the body, the mind, uh, what makes up the body and mind. You're meeting what's before that. You're meeting your true self pure beingness and so it's like coming home to something that is truly you because the ego is not you mm -hmm. the yeah. one that thinks it's you is not you there's something before that there's something that's aware of the mind that is you yeah so it's not like Gary so that meeting Gary. particular saying yeah that saying that you said is is related to that you meet your true self you meet your yourself when you come to a guru that is a possibility, but not always the case. Mm. There has to be a certain level of openness in a person, undefendedness in a person for that to occur. Mm -hmm. Would you say it's, if there is the openness, there is something about that person? Like there's just something about their presence, the way they speak, their overall, just their spirit? What is it about a realized being that that why do they have the magic touch with certain people because they have a presence when someone is enlightened that that's aware of the mind is aware of itself and it mm -hmm. stays aware of itself that is enlightenment mm -hmm. and that creates a presence that can be felt by the sensitive mm -hmm. oh. and that presence is an expanding energy field. So when you come into it, your mind starts expanding to some degree and you start losing the ability to think. You start going into no mind. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm. That's what happened to me with Osho. Mm. I won Sri Rajneesh. Uh, I sat with him and chatted with him and lost my mind. Is that in that interview that you have on your channel? Yeah, that's in the interview. He got me. <laughs> I was, uh, he got me, he got me good. <laughs> <laughs> In a good way, yeah. <laughs> well, he changed my life. It was another shift. It was another shift of consciousness. Um, the first shift was more of a shift away from a, a rather dark life to a much brighter light life. And when I met Osho, it was a shift into the, into the light. It was a shift towards uh, super consciousness. Mm. Uh, is that video the first time you met him? That was the first time I'd spoken to him. I'd been there for, uh, I'd been there the year before and sat with him for four months. Mm -hmm. And I'd been there for a while and sat with him before that uh, interview. But, you know, he was so big back in the day. There was thousands of people. He couldn't get within 50 meters of him. Mm -hmm. He was just too big. Yeah. Uh, oh, something special about him obviously you know but there's something special about his presence yeah, yeah. I, just like the way he spoke and just you could just see i could see it through video i could feel it through video so i can't imagine what it's like to be in the same room have him look in your eyes and utter words so i definitely can understand that transmission how it can be powerful from person to person um yeah 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 it was powerful with him. Uh, he was very, he was very big. Mm. <laughs> Why do you think he got so big? Because let's be honest, there's other people that are saying what he's saying, but why, what was it about him that made him so popular? You think? He put out a book from sex to super consciousness and it hit the, the sexual revolution back oh. in the early, early seventies, uh, late sixties. And it just, the hippies got onto him, mm -hmm. you know, it's like, wow, this free love, you know, it's like he, he became very popular worldwide and got called the sex guru because um, he talked about from sex to super consciousness. Mm -hmm. uh, he became, he became a, 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 the table talk of just about every hippie on the planet. And so by the time I got to him in, uh, in the uh, mid-80s, well, 84, 
I took sannyas in 83. The place was absolutely chock-a-block with hippies, but by that time, he also started to attract a lot of wealthy people. So there was all sorts of different people that were wearing red robes and beads and uh, dancing to his music. Mm Mm-hmm. It was an amazing club to join. I actually have no regrets whatsoever. <laughs> yeah. From what I know about it, it does seem pretty amazing. But you got, by the t- when I joined, I was um, 28 or 29, and I was running a publishing company, my publishing company, and uh, I was pretty straight. You know, I had the three piece suit and uh, was, was having a, a successful life, and all of a sudden, I come into these people wearing red robes and orange robes and <laughs> and uh, wearing malas and beads with a picture of a guru on it. And I thought, well, that's pretty weird until I did one of his courses. Mm. And in the course, something called me to come. Something called me to come and see him. And I took Sanyas and I went and saw him and my whole life changed again. Yeah. It was a jump. It was a jump in consciousness. It was a shift. In consciousness. Mm-hmm. Wow. Hmm. I've heard you say that when you met him, there was nobody there, right? There is. No, a, there was an absence. Could you extrapolate upon that when you meet somebody, there's nobody there? Is it because they're just like a pure reflection, like we talked about before? Not really. It's like you could fall into him. Wow. Okay. It's like most people have an outgoing an outgoing resistance to life, the ego. He had an ingoing presence, so it's almost like you'd fall into him. Wow. Because there was an absence. And so he was the first person that I had ever run into that I couldn't actually um, find someone in. Like I couldn't feel his energy as a a human being. Because mm-hmm. most human beings put out an energy field of some some kind, usually related to the resistance they're offering the world. Wow. But he was the only one that I couldn't read. There was just nothing there. Wow. He was the first one. So there was no pushing away. There was no defense. It didn't feel like it. It felt like more of a falling in. Wow. Well, and that was really unusual for me because, yeah. you know, like in the West, you just don't meet people like that. Mm. Mm-hmm. Because it's not part of our culture, it's not part of our religion to actually be absent. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> we, we get into bigger, better, and more powerful. We don't get into let's become less than. Yeah, it's the complete opposite of that, bigger, better, more powerful. It is the complete opposite. It really is. Yeah. So the undoing process that I just spoke about earlier is about becoming less than, not about becoming more than, but about taking away all the things that stop you from flying, mm-hmm. all the things that are heavy. And all the things that are heavy are your belief systems. Mm-hmm. And would you say it's like a great simplification of the mind Very and much lifestyle? So. Yeah. I would absolutely agree with that. It is a great simplification to the degree where you start living with no mind, in other words, you're back to being like about two or three years old where you're witnessing the world, but you're not thinking about it anymore. You're just enjoying it. Mm-hmm. And truly <laughs> Because we went it. to school and we learned how to live in our heads. Yeah. Yeah. It's almost evil when you put it that way. It's like, I mean, I know we talked about before, we shouldn't condemn others and condemn the world, but in a way it's like, hmm, I don't know. It just seems wrong. We're programmed in such a way that uh, leads us into unhappiness and suffering and just, uh, it's just a thick way of living, if that makes sense. Well, we're programmed at school to be highly competitive, both in sport and in academia. And that prepares us to be soldiers for combat. Yeah. Wow. Mm -hmm. Jeez. (sighs) Man. So meditation uh, helps you reclaim reality from the dream that you lost in Mm -hmm. because meditation is simply putting your awareness on what is real and everything is real except what you think. Hmm. Everything is real except what you think. Yep. Yeah. 
but everybody thinks everybody thinks what they think is real. The That's problem. true. They do. People believe their mind, mm -hmm. and that is the problem. If you can get back to no mind, if you can get back into just witnessing, you see a whole different world out here, and you see a very beautiful world. You don't get caught in judgments. You don't get caught in problems. You don't get caught in suffering. Yeah. And you were like that when you were one two and two. Mm -hmm. You were here. You were present. You were witnessing everything, but you weren't caught in the bull dust yet. Mm-hmm. Uh, man, unless ye become like children, then you'll never enter the kingdom of heaven. Yeah, Jesus said that. But that's a very misunderstood uh, quote because people don't realize, well, you have to go back to no mind. People think that you, if you, that you just become innocent. No, true innocence is living in no mind. Mm -hmm. And that's not something the church teaches. <laughs> no, that's for sure. Oh, man. No mind. mind. Yep, just here. Just here, aware of everything, present to everything, but not thinking about everything. Mm. And it all, would you say, starts with the breath, focusing on the breath? Oh, no, it just starts with being present to, to what's around you. Like I, I, I got into diving when I was very young. And that led me into meditation because in diving, I got in the water and all of a sudden my thoughts would stop. I'd just be with my environment. Mm. And so, uh, and being in the gangs, I had to have present moment awareness because if I didn't, I would have got beaten up. I had to know what was beside me, what was behind me, what was in front of me the whole time. Now, when you're that aware of your surroundings, you are in no mind to a large degree because if you think, you lose that awareness. Mm-hmm. Mm. Yeah. And riding motorcycles is the same. If you're not present to reality, you die. Yeah. So would you recommend in a general sense for us to find that which brings us close to the no mind? It could be motorcycles, it could be surfing, playing the guitar, meditation, but whatever brings us into the current moment. Go yeah, whatever that. brings you into reality, because we're talking reality now. What you see, what you feel, what you hear is real. What you think about it is not. Uh huh. Because thinking... and so I see myself as a reality teacher, not as a spiritual teacher. But I'm trying to help people get back to reality, mm -hmm. because most people have lost it. They live in their heads in a matrix, which is not real. Yeah. Wow. It's either like in the future or the past, right? Or analyzing. Yeah. Jeez, man. <sighs> but yet it's simple, right? It's, it's simple to do what we're, we're talking about. It's hard once, you're, once default patterns have been developed. We develop default patterns over a couple of years of practice. That's how long it takes to develop a default pattern. And um, the default patterns are then very hard to, to alter because mm -hmm. they're like hardwired. Mm -hmm. And so developing a default pattern to be present to reality rather than present to what you think takes a fair bit of practice. Mm -hmm. Almost creating a, a ritual orientated lifestyle in one's life. Yep. Yeah. It's true. Well, however you are now is what you've been practicing. Mm -hmm. You know, it's that mm -hmm. simple. Yeah. We, because we have the ability to use will, we can change something temporarily completely for a moment or two, but for it to stay continually like that, we have to develop a default pattern of that, which takes a fair bit of practice. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So once we kind of get the glimpse into that sense of no mind, a Satori, even if it's just a second, right? A millisecond, just get a little taste. Would you say that's enough to change that will? Is there a different will that comes about in one's mind? Okay. So that is the invitation to do the work on the mind to prepare the ground for that to occur again. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. See, a mind that will support enlightenment is a mind that is flatlined, a mind that is equanimous, a mind that doesn't get disturbed by this, that, or the other. It stays equal. And that takes a fair bit of work to develop a mind like that 
because we love getting upset as Westerners when things go wrong. Well, someone who's awake, that doesn't happen. They stay even. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I see. Hmm. Matter of fact, they stay cool, calm, and deadly. Cool, calm, and deadly. Yeah. That's good. Deadly. <laughs> 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 yeah. Cool, calm, and deadly. Wow. Okay. Yeah. So, would you say that is like the, I don't even know if you want to call it will, but that is like the will of or the energy that just naturally comes about from a realized being is just a certain equanimity to the happening, the phenomena of life? Not really. It's not just, um, it, it is, it is uh, realized beings, but it's also something that can be de- developed um, as an ego-based person. I went in, when I, I've, been in, I've been in charge of people since I've been a little boy. And when you're in charge of people, you have to be responsible for everybody. And I learned that to be successful in business, I had to be cool, calm, and deadly because I had a lot of staff. Mm -hmm. And that's what works. And so for years and years, 20 years before awakening, or maybe not that far, 15 years before awakening, I was cool, calm, and deadly. (laughs) I see. Because I developed that um, because that was the only – once you lose respect from your staff, you've lost your business. Mm -hmm. And unless you're cool, calm, and deadly when you're running a lot of staff, you lose your business. It's simple. Yeah, I got you. <laughs> mm. So not all cool, calm, and deadly people are realized, but would you say most, if not all, realized beings are cool, calm, and deadly? Well, the ones I've met. <laughs> I'll take your head off if you're not careful. <laughs> mm. Well, take, not literally, obviously, but take your head off, take the ego right out of you. You know what I'm saying? Someone who's awake can see, can see a fair bit because they've seen through their own mind. Uh-huh. And so they read you pretty well. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's uh, the high part. consciousness really rules. <laughs> it rocks. Yeah. Yeah, it rocks. Wow. How's your mind doing right now? (laughs) Well, to be honest with you, uh, in the interview, right, I always have to try and think of stuff to ask, but um, it's almost counterintuitive to the natural element of being with you, you know? It's almost like uh, you don't want me to think, which is, that's, I get it, that's perfectly fine. And I understand why. Um, so it's almost like, um, how do I put this? I, it's, I, it's just a loss for thought, you know? Like the thought isn't um, coming through, but that's good. That's you started point. losing that when I started talking to you. And that's what happened to me when I was with Osho. And that's what attracted to me, that beautiful space of not being able to think because mm-hmm. it is so damn peaceful. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You're interviewing me, and I was interviewing Osho, and I was in the same position as you. And I had to ask these questions. I was on camera, right? Mm-hmm. And I, I lost it. <laughs> and at one stage, he leaned forward to me, and he said, you're not listening to me. And it wasn't that I wasn't listening to him. I'd lost my mind. Yeah. I'd lost the ability to think. Mm-hmm. And this is one of the beauties of being in the presence of someone who's awake. Your mind starts expanding. And when it starts expanding, you can start to find reality. You can start to find what's in the background. This that's aware of the mind. And so it's a pathway towards enlightenment, hanging out with someone who's awake. Yeah. Yep. It makes it difficult to do interviews. It does, Gary, and uh, I've been enjoying playing with you so far. Yeah, save. It's been a good time. Yeah, a lot of times uh, I just think, why am I doing this? You know, what's the point? Because uh, it's like, how much more do I have to really ask people? You know, I get to certain points in talks in this one where I'm just like, all right, well, 
obviously the truth resides in silence, it resides in stillness. What much more can I say or you say to help anybody that may listen or help me, you know? So it's kind of like, all right, well. You could come here. You could come <laughs> where, where, are you, where are you right now? I live outside of Boston. Ah, oh, you're in Boston, America. You could come and hang out over here in Australia. Mm -hmm. We have great senses of humor. We put up with Americans. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Do you have a lot of Americans there? I do, yeah, because yeah. a lot of Americans are interested in this subject of mm. uh, raising consciousness levels, enlightenment, heart. A lot of Americans are looking for it. Yeah. I, talk, I have Americans staying with me now. I might have to. Yeah, you, you come over. You've got, you, you, you dress really brightly. <laughs> <laughs> you have a lot of fun. Here. I'll bring the shirt for you. Yeah. Mm. Well, oh, wow. Oh, I seriously might have to. Australia, man. Australia to an American seems like a fictional place. It seems like such a faraway land, you know, like a, a different planet, <laughs> you know. <laughs> Yet we speak the same language. Um, we got kangaroos on the property here. Uh, we got 12 and a half acres here. So we got uh, kangaroos, we got possums, we got the snakes, we got the scorpions, we got everything here. <laughs> that's why, yeah, that's, that's what I'm saying. It seems like a totally different world but it's tempting man <sighs> we don't take prisoners the, the americans are free to leave anytime they want <laughs> yeah <laughs> well hey you know what you want to wrap this thing up um i think this is probably a good note to wrap this up at um do you have any last words you want to say to anybody watching listening i love you gary I love you too. You know what? I was going to say that. I was going to say that to you. I'm glad you said it first. I love you, man. I love you, Vishwan. <laughs> I appreciate Thank you coming you, on here. I really do. I appreciate you sharing your time, effort, and wisdom with me and everybody that will listen in the future. Um, keep on keeping on. Thank you. If you want to talk to me privately anytime, Gary, look me up. I'll have a chat with you privately. I greatly appreciate that. Thank you. Well done. No well, have a good day, and um, yeah, I wish you all the best. Thank you. Thank you kindly. Goodbye. Bye-bye.